It's almost a meme. Anytime you talk about the divisions in the Bible, you've got the Old Testament taking up a big chunk of it, and then you've got the New Testament taking up a much smaller chunk. And people will say, well, the God of the Old New Testament is revealed in Christ. He is a God of grace, we know, because of the New Testament. Peace, mercy, kindness, and love. But the God of the Old Testament, not so much. There's too much blood, too much war, too much disregard for human life, and it makes people uncomfortable. And so they like to divide that. The famous Oxford evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins, said this about the God of the Old Testament in his book, The God Delusion. Quote, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomadistic, capriciously malevolent bully. End of quote. Probably not too many ministers are quoting that today. (laughs) But I have no problem reading it. Especially knowing that in the last few months, Professor Dawkins has been actually writing in the UK and pushing that we need our Christian culture even if we are not Christians. And he's saying what we're replacing Christian culture with, what we've imported into Britain, is destroying us. And he said, I, while I do not hold to Christianity, I want us to retain our Christian culture. And I'm thinking, buddy... You're like, the, you're like somebody that shot the pony and then wants to ride it. Um, you know, there are consequences to what we believe about God and about humans and their life. Most Christians, I'm quite sure, would disagree with Dawkins. But they wouldn't be able to really rebut that. Because frankly, their knowledge of the Old Testament is incomplete. And they don't really understand the flow of God throughout his book. Starting in May... Uh, 26th, we're going to take a look at the strange and wonderful world of Scripture. And it's going to be a long series. And then we're going to add to that some long form videos about midsummer. And somewhere in uh, the end of June, 1st of July, we're also going to do small segments for the Monday morning messages because it's just that important. It is important for us to understand what our book is. Too many of us don't grasp some of the Old Testament, or we avoid it as being very unpleasant and hard for us to really rationalize. Our problem is the way that Christians have been taught to look at their Bibles, and and we will, we're going to look at that. There's a huge problem with the way we look at our Bible, not with the Bible, but with the way we look at it. If it's handled correctly, or as Paul put it, rightly divided, the Bible brings us to God as revealed in Jesus. Handled incorrectly, we get thousands of warring denominations all declaring that they're the only right one, all claiming to have a unique truth and a set of templates on how to read the Bible. And yet, even they often ignore those uncomfortable stories in the Old Testament. There's two ways to handle them, I've found. One is just to ignore them and hope they go away and nobody finds them. And the other is to try to make it all holy and good. And God in his righteous kindness you know, ordered the death of all the women and children. That's, I've read those books. I've heard those sermons. I do remain unmoved. We need to address that head on. And we will, starting May 26th in the sermons. And again, some long form videos and Monday morning messages in midsummer. For now... I want to call us back to the Old Testament. For people who are the people of God, as we said, everyone's welcome at the table. For people who call others to remember their God from the beginning until now and trusting him with the future, we need to talk about our story. When I was a boy, we used to have Bibles in our pews. Those of you that aren't church people don't know what a pew is. A pew is just a long seat that everybody sat in. And you you would have rows of these. And in the back of the pew, in front of you, would be a little shelf, a little bracket that they'd usually put in a songbook. And another thing I may have to explain. And then a Bible. 
and maybe a visitor's card or something like that. Some of you remember that. Remember in America, when, uh, in the Appalachians, they didn't have air conditioning, so you'd also have fans stuck there that all had pictures of Jesus and advertisements of funeral homes on them. <laughs> it, was, it was uncomfortable. But in our Bibles, most of the time, they were New Testament with Psalms. I remember the first time we got New Testament with Psalms, Proverbs, and Maps. And I was unsure how that would go down. We were told, pay attention to the things that were said on this side of the cross. We were completely divorced from our Jewish roots. We were taught a replacement theology that basically stated God's chosen people were the Jews, but they blew it. So he dropped them and grabbed the Gentiles. It's wrong. It goes against the entire flow of scripture and a host of passages in our New Testament that warn us against inter even entertaining such an idea. Not that that stops so many Christians from continuing to think it, even if they don't teach it. And you'll hear little phrases like, well, of course God loves the Jews and we aren't racist, but let's consider the older books the foundational books in our community of faith. If we don't, we divorce Jesus' teaching from the centuries that led up to his arrival. We won't understand half the things Jesus said. We won't know the context of what they're talking about. It makes Christians orphans without any heritage. In the 1800s, there were many groups in America that thought here we're here and we're free. What we're going to do is strip all the history all the human interpretation out of scripture, and we're just going to read the Bible with clear glasses, clear minds, uninfluenced by everything else, and it'll be fine. And it wasn't fine, because you can't do that. You bring your history with you. One of the things when I, I used to be in the counseling field and I would train others, uh, one of the things I would always remind them is when a person comes in, they're not on their own. They're bringing their history. They're bringing their hurts. They're bringing their triumphs. They're bringing all of that with them. You don't see it, but you have, to, you have to factor that in to what you're doing. When my father was placed in a nursing home and unable to really function as, as, a, as a person that you would know and get to talk to, I put a big sign on his door that said, my name is Bill Mead. And I was born in abject poverty, and I, I did his accomplishments, what he had done, and then at the very end said, remember who I am while I wait to cross this one last river. And that evidently went viral on Twitter and the internet, and uh, Hollywood stars were retweeting it, and the news people came out to interview me. What an odd idea. No, we always bring it with us. We bring everything with us. Christians need their Old Testament. Or we'll never understand Hebrews. Jude, never understand Revelation. Because they're soaked in Old Testament teachings, images, metaphors, arguments, and allusions. It makes us twist Galatians and Romans so that we can legitimize our ignoring that our faith even today is Jewish in character because it came from Jewish sources. Designed that way by God. Jesus was a Jew. And the one who took the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob seriously called God Father. He called the prophets the prophets and quoted them. Those sent into all the world to tell others about Jesus, the 70, and then at the end in the Great Commission, were without exception Jews. As Paul put it, it's a Jewish tree. He said, Gentiles, you have been grafted into this tree. And you can, if you want to, point out all the mistakes the Jews have made. And he brings them up. He says, but remember, you are grafted in the tree. You are not the tree. You're not replacing the tree. You're merely being added to it. That should adjust our, our feelings about some things. In the New Testament, we learn that Jesus loves us and cares for us, and that's, that's wonderful news. That's good news. Or the word we usually use for that, that's gospel. Yet, in the Old Testament, we learn something that we need to understand first. 
Something we need to teach toddlers. It's so hard. Toddlers don't have a sense of the other. They are, they are their world. They don't quite even understand that their mothers aren't them. And therefore, if they're hungry, mothers should materialize something there. If they don't want to get in a car, mothers should not let them get in a car because they don't see the separation. I'm afraid a lot of us act like toddlers around God. Here's what you learn in the Old Testament. First and foremost, this earth is not ours and the universe does not resolve, revolve around us. And I don't know, uh, you might be thinking, well, duh. No, I'm sorry. Take a little bit of time there and be sad because we all wish it did. We do, although we'll never admit it. At some level, we wish the world was just run the way we want it to be run. Thank you very much. In fact, a lot of people I meet that are atheists, not all of them, but a great many of them, it all boils down to they don't believe there is a God because the universe isn't being run the way they would run it if they were God. The Old Testament teaches us this world isn't ours and this universe will never revolve around us. In our Western world, we demand that things progress in a timely, organized, logical manner. But in the Old Testament, we learn that God often moves slowly, unpredictably, and sometimes paradoxically, this way and then that way. As a song says, God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. I love that line. And trying to overlay Western logic on a transcendent God is a futile task. Frankly, it's a silly task. You've got the wrong template for the job. In a world, here's a great, one of my favorite things about God in the Old Testament, which means God now too. In a world that celebrates celebrity, and that's even the same word, right? The same root word. This is the person being celebrated, the celebrity. The Old Testament reveals a God that could not care less. Cares nothing, not one iota about celebrity, worldly wealth, or power. He is not impressed by our tanks, social media influencers, presidents, kings, or war machines. He couldn't care less. Examples? Sure. In the birth of Moses, God identifies by name two Hebrew midwives who saved the life of Moses. But he never names the Pharaoh because he doesn't care. He is not wowed by the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh thought he was God. God didn't think he was significant enough to name. A blind beggar comes up to, God, to Jesus and interrupts Jesus' teaching and everybody else is telling him to hush. God has Jesus stop, go stand in front of him, and we even get his name, Bartimaeus. How many first century blind beggars' names do you know? Well, I'll, you don't need to do a search. One. We know one. Because God liked his name. And in fact, Jesus stood in front of him, and instead of saying, do you know who I am? Do you understand? None of that. They weren't interested in celebrity. Jesus looks at him and says, what would you like me to do for you? In other words, what do you need? It is amazing the humility of God. Here's a weird one. If I were to ask you who was the greatest of Israel's kings, 99% of you would say David. However, history has found evidences of these kings. History has not only what they built and what they laid and the size of their cities, but also their names in other places. You know, Finkelstein's book, The Bible Unearthed, is just one example of this. There are so many. <clears throat> there is almost universal agreement among all historians. King Omri was by far the greatest king of Israel. Had the most success, greatest peace, expanded the borders, enriched the people better than any other king by far. The Bible gives him eight verses. God's not interested in celebrity. In the Old Testament, 
God reverses the direction of religion. The pagan God cried and that made it rain. And he got angry and sent lightning down. Everything was top down, top down. But our scripture shows us a God who listens to us and then acts for us. And then he acts, as Josh said in the giving section, through us and with us. It is still his world. There are patterns in the Old Testament that if we read it and we, un we understand what we're reading, they give us great comfort. One of them is that the gift of salvation is found in the middle of judgment. In Genesis 8, verses 15 through 19, then Noah said to, uh, God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that's with you, the birds, the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on earth and be fruitful and increase in number in it. Well, they did all of that. He's saying there was judgment, but now there is blessing. Come on out. And by the way, we often, um, we often talk about the, the sacrifice and then the, the rainbow. He says, God didn't put the rainbow there to remind you of the flood. He said he would put it up there so that he would remember to never destroy the earth with water again. A God who grows in compassion toward us. There is blessing there. How about after the dispersal of the people at Babel? In Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, they, we, we know this story. He sees they are upset. He scatters the people. And yet, when he scatters them, he blesses them. They reproduce. They become greater because they're not in one area. They are given blessing as they go. And Jesus, in fact, said, God makes the rain and sun to fall on everyone. He doesn't hold back. I don't like those people, so I won't. And in fact, but that, that's what we teach, isn't it, sometimes? We teach as if the book of Job had never been written. Therefore, if we have you know, a famine, we say God's punishing us. We, have, we say a flood, then God's angry at us. If uh, somebody has seven kids that either think they're blessed or cursed, you know, it's really up to them. Uh, and yet God does not use those kind of metrics. He never has. And did you notice something about Abraham's blessing? He said, I bless you. I will bless you to be a blessing. We sometimes miss that second phrase because we're, we're going real quick. And then we get real upset when we hit the circumcision bed. Well, Paul says the circumcision of the flesh is not what God wanted. That for a time it had to be the marking of the flesh so that you would remember who your God was. But we remember who our God is because our heart is circumcised. We've cut away the dead. We are now new to God. We are alive to God. And that's what God wants. He wants our hearts marked, not necessarily our bodies. Abraham was a blessing in a time of crisis and confusion. So were the prophets, the kings, the judges, the disciples, the apostles, and you. In this season of our world where we see a young woman who cannot leave her hotel because 10,000 people are howling for her blood outside merely because she is from a nation that they don't like. And all she wanted to do is sing a song where the judges were so afraid they gave her no points or few points. But when the public opened up, they gave her overwhelming po points. It's the leaders who are so terrified and therefore allow the divisions. What are we supposed to do? What we've always done. Love God. Love one another. Serve. Give. Be a people of peace no matter what's going on. And if one of the mob twists and breaks an ankle or gets hungry, we take care of them, just as we would if they were not in a mob. Because as we are all one in God's sight, we have direction to be like God now. Go into all the world to whom much is given. 
I send you out like a sheep among wolves. Let your light shine in the darkness. Be a city on a hill. Be a city of refuge. Be a sanctuary. You see it again and again and again. Take the long view of history and don't allow today to upset you. Don't allow, no matter what, I mean, the media is bound and determined to terrify you so that you can buy the products they advertise and be beholden to them. Don't do that. God's always led us through history. And since our first books were written, and even before, what you see is not the end of the matter. Let me just give you an example of what knowing your Old Testament does to make you smile. In Genesis 12, verses 6 through 9, Abram, at that time, it was not known as Abraham, is sent out into the desert. Canaan is a big place. But in all the story, only three places are named. Now that should interest you, even if you'd ever noticed it. Shechem, Bethel, and Negev. Abraham never saw the end of the story. That's important. None of us ever see the end of the story. When he died, Shechem, Bethel, Negev were still isolated places that seemed to play no part in the story of God or his people. But later, 215 years later, Jacob, one of his great-grandsons, his whole story is told. Three places are named. Shechem, Bethel, Negev. When he died, still not much going on in either of those, any of those. And then in the book of Joshua, there are three sites named as occupied by Joshua. In chapters 8, 10, and 11, guess which ones they are. Shechem, Bethel, Negev. And then comes 715 years later, the people of Israel live in Shechem, Bethel, Negev. 715 years after God led Abram through. 500 years after God led Jacob through. The story is unfolding. What you see now is not the end of the story. In movies, sometimes, they'll try to make you think the movie is ending. And all of a sudden, oh boy, you know, something, the dead guy's not dead. In fact, that is so often used that now I just pretty much doubt anybody's dead. Right? If somebody's coming out of a closet. You know, I, I don't watch horror movies because why? It, it's kind of like, also, I don't slam my head in the refrigerator door. Why be uncomfortable? But in, in noticing some memes and movies and themes, you see that. Well, God tells us, no, I've been here before. And I've walked with my people in dreams, and I will walk with you in dreams. God sends us out into this new world, but it's new to us. It's not new to him. When God sends us out, he is not afraid. He is not panicked. Therefore, we should not be either. I've often wondered myself and then been able to talk to others when they wondered, why isn't God doing, why isn't God here? Why isn't God? And I'm saying the reason is he's not panicked. We are, but he is not. In chapter 15 and verse 1 of Genesis, he says, I am your shield. I am your reward. You know, there are, there are discussions going on now that just make me wonder about people. Uh, they, you know, women will get onto TikTok. It seems to be a, a woman thing. Every so often, men will come on too, but they know the comment section is going to kill them. And they'll basically say, why should I marry? You know, what do you bring into this relationship? What do you bring in? And I'm going, well, you know, there were used to be the dowry thing and do you own land and, and the like. I get that. Perhaps it would be better just to think you get that person. That's your gift. And isn't that what we say with the better or worse, the richer or poorer? We're, we're, now, in Breton, I got to tell you, uh, most of the time now they've, they've weeding this out as they're modernizing the liturgy. But in the wedding, they, they, they still have the man say, I pledge thee my trowel, which 
it doesn't mean anything. And so in America, it used to read, I, thee, I do thee all my earthly goods in thou. But frankly, they don't have any earthly goods at that stage, do they? It's like, oh, there goes the bicycle. You know, you, there's not much there. With God, we love him not because of the sunshine and the rain, not because of the kids or the lack of them. We love him because he is our shield and he is our reward. And with these people walking through faith in the Old Testament, I, I love reading about Abraham and those after him arguing with God, questioning God, questioning his timeness, questioning his goodness, his actions, his inactions, and we do the same. And the answer God gave more than any other to those complaints, I am the Lord. Hmm. Using the same name given to Moses on the mountain. In other words, I, I know what I'm doing. I am the Lord. I got you. I'm enough. He calls us just like he called Abraham in Genesis 17. That Rick, thank you, Rick, for making videos for us. We got to uh, have a meal with, with Rick and our friends from Parker, Colorado a couple months ago. And that was just so delightful to get to see them. And we asked him to make videos, and they did. Most of you don't. Wagging finger. The scripture says, walk before me and be blameless. Well, God knows we're not going to quite rise to that level. But it should be a, a laudable goal, don't you think? I think so. Abraham's wife struggled through all of this. And I really feel for Sarai. Because she just, she really, Jesus in the New Testament, they refer to her as a hero of the faith. But she didn't come off that way sometimes. He struggled, she struggled, she struggled. And through all of this, God changed her name from Sarai to Sarah. You know what he calls her? Princess. It's okay, princess. You're my princess. All that she went through. And he goes, if you just understood, you're, you're princess. I still call my daughter princess. Probably shouldn't. Because she's grown up and has three sons that are athletic and strong. And if she ever loses those on me, who knows? Well, I know. It won't end well. I know she's a grown-up woman of many accomplishments. But in my heart, she's still princess. And my wife wants even... I have one granddaughter. She's my favorite granddaughter. And uh, she's figured out the math on that. But I told her it doesn't matter. And, and I, I call her princess. And my wife goes, well, what does that make me then? I said, well, I'm pretty sure you're the empress at this stage, you know, of all things. Uh, now that my mother has passed in particular, anything left has been bequeathed unto you. I just love that he called her princess. Even when she was questioning him, once Abraham fell on his face and laughed. But when he got to the point on his face, a uh, point in his life where he fell on his face and just listened, God blessed him. Once he doubted God, once he got to where he began to trust God, he was blessed. And in return, Abraham has blessed all of us. We are blessed to be a blessing, to walk with God, to leave tracks so that our children and our grandchildren and neighbors and strangers who see us will find their place in this very long, beautiful, mysterious, strange story of God. For it is his world. So a, a wee challenge, a little challenge for you. Start each day. Try, make, however you need to be reminded, a post-it note, a little alarm on your phone, whatever it is, to take a couple of moments and acknowledge God and acknowledge that it is his universe and that we are part of his story, and just say to him, help me be, help me advance the story today. Help me to play my part well today. Doesn't have to be a long prayer. Some of you are gifted at long prayers. I'm not. Uh, to me, prayers are short, but they're frequent through the day. But however you pray, however you acknowledge him, even if it is just a few moments saying, I acknowledge that God is God, he is Lord 
This is his universe. I, your servant, be with me today as I live out my faith. That's enough. And those are not magic words. You don't have to write those down and use them. Use your words and see where that takes you. I think you're going to enjoy seeing where that takes you. Wait till you hear the stories we start with on Scripture on the 26th. Little advertisement next week is a special service we are doing really for everybody who's graduating, but more for that. It is a charge given out of Scripture, but it is a charge given to all of us at different stages in our life. And so make sure you tune in or you save it for your graduates, but also for yourselves and especially for those of you who never got a blessing from your parents, who never got the blessing and the charge woven together from your parents or your life. I want you to receive it next week. So make sure you're with us then.